Welcome to the CEC Report. I'm Robert Barwick and I'm joined today by CEC's Victoria State Chairman, Jeremy Beck. Welcome, Jeremy. Thanks, Robbie. In this week's CEC Report, momentum building to break up Australia's crooked banks and stop being willful victims of drought and high electricity prices. There are clear solutions. Before we begin, Jeremy, I have an important announcement to make. For the regular viewers of the show, you'll remember last week's episode, um, Craig and Lisa discussed this film called The Magnitsky Act Behind the Scenes. And it's a film that exposes one of the most um, contentious issues between the United States and Russia, which is a, a law that was passed in 2012 that, that sanctions certain Russians for, for, that were accused of being involved in a certain act. And it's that, that, that law has become the basis of more sanctions targeting individuals, right? So it's something that the, the Russians have taken exception to. It was explained on last week's show. The good news is the producers of the film have just released it publicly online and it's on Vimeo. You can go and watch it. You, you've got to pay to rent it. But if there's any film you're ever going to pay to rent, it's this one. So let's just watch the trailer, the, the preview for this film. The story itself is horribly shocking. Sergey Magnitsky was my lawyer and uh, he was murdered by the Russian state. By me telling the story in 10 minute testimonies, it's created laws, it's created major international investigations. It's created huge repercussions with the Russian government. We are sending a signal to Vladimir Putin and to the Russian kleptocracy. Anybody who says that Sergei Magnitsky didn't expose a crime before he was arrested is just trying to whitewash the role of the Russian government. Es ist die Geschichte eines Amerikaners, der nicht Geschäfte machte und reich wurde, weil er stahl. Und es ist die Geschichte von 230 Millionen Dollar, die eben gestohlen wurden. Die, these kind of documents all come from broader sources. Now, so there you go. I can't emphasize enough how valuable this film is. And what I like about it the most, Jeremy, is that the main character, Bill Browder, who I think is one of the most sinister individuals in the world, his lies are exposed in the film by himself, mm -hmm. by his own words, right? Because mm -hmm. the filmmaker set out to make a film on his behalf mm -hmm. to tell his story. And the filmmaker, who's Russian, read the Russian documents he was using and realized they don't say what you say they say. And yeah. that began a process where he, by the end of the film, he's fully exposed. And it's very important because we live in, in a world now where the backdrop is this tension between the United States and Russia. Tension which we've been worried about for a long time could easily escalate into something more. A lot of the accusations, we're used to having all these accusations made against Russia by the American government, the British government, the Australian government. We can't prove them to be true. We don't know personally. So we have to accept it on trust, right? Yeah. Well, this film proves that th those kind of accusations are often based on real disinformation, which mm. the media and the politicians never have any proof of. 
Mm. Right? Oh, exactly right. I mean, I watched the full two hours. I can't stress enough. You know, if you watch this, it'll just blow you away. The lies were being told. Channel 7 that ran that program, just straight out lying. They, they were. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was on the 29th mm -hmm. of July, the Channel 7 Sunday Night program, mm -hmm. where they had this guy on. Watch this film. We can't emphasise it enough. All right. So that said, let's get on with the program. So our first story today, momentum building to break up Australia's crooked banks. And the good news is, Jeremy, two days ago this week, the Greens announced their policy on breaking up the banks. And frankly, it's an excellent announcement. I'll just give you some of the details. Um, now, the Greens have long said that they support breaking up the banks, ending vertical integration, right? Um, we are the ones, though, that have pushed a specific law, right, the, the, uh, for an Australian Glass-Steagall Act. And the Greens have not had much detail of what they wanted. Well, now they've come out with detail, and the detail is good. So what they're, what they're putting forward as their policy is that um, banks can only provide financial services in one of four areas. Traditional banking, deposits and loans, large-scale superannuation funds, including default funds and choice funds, insurance, including life insurance and general product insurance, or complex financial products used for investment banking, hedge funds, self-managed super funds, financial markets, auditing and liquidation. In other words, what you would, to be technically correct, the, only the first of those is actual banking. And what they're saying is um, banks that do that cannot do any of the other things, but also if you're an insurance, that's all you are, is insurance. Mm -hmm. If you're a super, that's all you are, is, is super. So there's right? no conflict of interest. Get rid of conflicts of interest out of the system. That's very good. The other thing they've said is they want to um, hand over more regulation to the ACCC, Right, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, instead of um, ASIC and APRA, which have failed so miserably. Now, that's very significant because um, people, our regular viewers will remember that back in February, the um, APRA bail-in law mm -hmm. passed through the Senate with seven senators present in the room. Mm. And I made a big deal. I was there, right? And I singled out for criticism the Green Senator, Peter Wish Wilson. Um, because he signed off on it going, and we fundamentally disagree with that. But we also pointed out, there was two things we pointed out about what he said. One was very bad, because he said, I trust APRA. <laughs> you got to trust the regulators, he said, I trust APRA. I'm sure he regrets that now. Well, I'll get to that in a minute, there's evidence. <laughs> the second thing he said was, he welcomed any mm. legislation in the parliament for Glass-Steagall to mm. break up the banks. He calls for someone to bring that forward, right? Mm. So what's happened since then is, we have brought forward legislation mm. for Glass-Steagall, which Bob Catter introduced on the 25th of June. So that legislation is now in Parliament. And Mr Wish Wilson, in making this announcement two days ago, he, ha he hasn't done a mere culpa and said I was wrong, but he said this. I'll read out what he said, and you'll see it doesn't gel with what he said back in February about APRA. He goes, quote, Our regulation of the financial services and of the big banks has failed. There's been a lot of evidence that our regulators both across ASIC and APRA, have been captured. Well, never a truer word was spoken. So that would indicate to me that Senator Peter Wish Wilson has um, expanded his view since February. And this is very important. Now, what's also significant about it is this announcement by the Greens has attracted the endorsement of um, the former chairman of the ACCC, Professor Alan Fowles. And people may remember that name. He was the inaugural chairman of the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission. He hasn't been chairman for a long time, but one of his points is as that, the regulator he was part of, they're much more aggressive in using prosecution, right? And of course, that's been one of the criticisms of the whole banking sector, not just in Australia, around the world. The regulators don't prosecute anybody, right? Mm -hmm. They get away with murder or, or the financial equivalent of it. Um, Professor Fells, he's not, in, just, he's not just endorsing the Green statement. He's endorsing the policy of Glass-Steagall in his own words, right? So I'll just, read, I'll just read the comments that he was quoted in the Australian newspaper saying. He said, There are a number of serious structural issues that need to be considered. The first and most obvious is the separation of the activity of creating financial products and then offering so-called independent advisory services to customers on what are the best products. So that's vertical integration he's talking about, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, Glass-Steagall ends that. You can't be... You only, you know, if you're a bank, you can't provide financial services and then provide the products that you advise people to buy. Mm -hmm. right? You can't do that. 
Um, so he's, he's singling out vertical integration. And, now, and then he went on to say, quote, a second very important one is whether there should be a structural separation between traditional banking activities and the more risky investment activities. He said, he wanted to say, banks benefit from the implicit guarantee on their deposit liabilities which flow into their trading activities. So what he's talking about there is what some people in Australia called horizontal integration, but that just means the, the what Glass-Steagall is, is very fundamentally about, separating traditional banking from investment banking, right? So he's endorsing the separation, both types of separation. That's what the bill that Bob Cutter introduced does, mm -hmm. right? So we've got someone of his ilk endorsing that. Now, I'm making a big deal about him endorsing it. He's just one Australian name. But he, as you know, he's, he, he, then he joins some very prominent people around the world mm -hmm. who also endorse it for the same reason, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. He's just one of the more prominent people in Australia to come out for this. So what the Greens announcement has achieved is expanded the debate. Mm -hmm. And very usefully, I'll be in Canberra next week um, talking to members of parliament and the timing is very useful because now this is the more people come on board and expand it um, this puts the onus on the two major parties Labor and Liberal and that's where our mobilization comes in so to, to regular viewers of the CEC report as you know we want you to be involved in this keep if you haven't contacted your member of parliament demand they support Bob Catter's bill do so if you already have done so do so more keep the pressure on them because Although the Greens have made this announcement, they don't have a bill. The mm. bill in Parliament is Bob Catter's bill, mm. right? And we, with this kind of momentum, um, I fail to, like, the, the banks are going to do everything in their power to try and stop it, but they're not, they don't have absolute power. Mm -hmm. They're not all powerful, right? And this is going really well. So, but it's because of people like you, the viewer, who's involved in this campaign. Um, so let's take a break. When we come back, Jeremy can do most of the talking. Welcome back to the CEC report. Stop being willful victims of drought and high electricity prices. There are clear solutions. Um, so Jeremy, let's deal with, deal with these two issues um, in order. We'll start with the drought first because that's, there's a real emphasis on it at the moment mm -hmm. because it is a big deal. Um, most of, apparently all of New South Wales has effectively been drought declared and mm -hmm. a lot of Queensland is uh, drought declared. So let's talk about actual solutions to this, right? Mm -hmm. And we want to discuss one short term one mm -hmm. and then some long-term solutions. Mm -hmm. The first, the first, what can the is the first thing that the government can do short-term to give these farmers some relief? We need legislation to deal with the banking side of things to have a debt moratorium. At the end of the day, these farmers can't continue to be viable if they're going to be foreclosed on by the banks, or, or if the interest charges are just yeah. going to put them further and further into debt that they'll never be able to pay off. You can't get blood out of a stone. The crippling debt uh, is yeah. the big, uh, yeah. huge problem out there. Yeah, so that. The, the government is actually already uh, guaranteed the banks in the global financial crisis. So, you know, why can't they guarantee the sustainability of our farming? I mean, this provides our food. It's, yeah. it's more important than just about anything. I mean, if you don't eat, you don't survive. Yeah, when it came to the yeah. banks surviving, yeah. the free market rules went out the window. Yeah. Yeah. And, the, and this is a strategic industry and the government mm. should make sure it survives. And this and get rid of the biggest burden on them straight away. Not, mm. not, not saying cancel at all, mm. right? But mm. just l alleviate the payment problem mm. burden and until they can get back on their feet. All right, long-term solutions mm. though. And mm. in a word, it comes down to infrastructure. Exactly right? right. There doesn't have to be this lack of water out there. So let's talk about mm. some projects. The first one is the Bradfield scheme. Mm -hmm. How would that work? Well, that was designed by um, Bradfield who designed the Sydney Harbour Bridge, a great engineer. Uh, it uses the water up in North Queensland. The, the rivers are Herbert, Tully, Burdekin rivers that normally would just flow out into the Coral Sea out in the Pacific Ocean. You divert them over the Great Dividing Range inland and eventually they would flow all the way into Lake Eyre. Uh, a series of dams and tunnels could generate hydroelectricity, provide enormous uh, agricultural water. And it irrigates all the way through. Irrigates all the way through, exactly. Yeah. All right, we've got, Bob, the other day Bob Catter was on Triple mm. M, I think. Mm. Um, being interviewed about this. Now, Bob mm. Catter, Member of mm. Parliament, is a great champion of the Bradfield scheme. It's mm. his part of the, his neck mm. of the woods. Um, we agree, this is another thing we agree with mm. him on. Um, just listen to Bob Catter talking about the Bradfield scheme on Triple M the other day. 
There's been so much about the drought and fundraising and everything else in the last week or so. But remember I was telling you about going up north during our, uh, our week off. To Went Cook up to Town. Cooktown and just saw some of the plumpest cattle I'll ever hope to see. Some of the most <laughs> wonderful pasture. And going, the rivers are enormous. The Mossman Gorge was just flowing and Barren Falls were flowing completely in the middle of winter in the dry season. Yes. And just going, we have to... To be like a snowy river project, we need to get all of that water down to the uh, southwest, sorry, the west of Queensland and New South Wales, and we solved this drought. It seemed so easy, and you said you found someone who might agree with me. Well, I found someone who's already suggesting that. He is one of our po- politicians, the Honourable Bob Catter. Good morning, Bob. God bless all the listeners. Hey, Bob, you've already thought of this Bob. idea. Where is it at? It's black. He's a bit smart, old Bradfield. He built the Sydney Harbour Bridge. He built the water supply for Sydney, which they're still using. He built the, the Story, uh, Story Bridge, Bridge too, Bob. The yeah. Story Bridge. He uh, found out that when Lake Torrens, it's a huge lake, almost right in the centre of Australia, when it filled up with water, one freak wet season, the rainfall increased two and a half inches. So he said, well, let's fill Lake Eyre, which is below sea level, from the giant rivers of North Queensland to turn the giant rivers up here where they run all the time and we have 100, 200 inch rainfall, dig a bit of a hole through the range and turn the top of that river back inland and you can take the water all the way down to Lake Eyre. Has the science been done on this, Bob? Has somebody actually sat down and and charted it and gone, this can be done? Uh, Yes, numerous times. It has been done and redone and redone. We, We sort of had a look at the Bradfield scheme. We said, no. You want to fill Lake Air, you do that with a ditch coming up from Spencer Gulf. So that will make it rain. And, uh, yeah, they've done a lot, a lot of work on this, even over recent years, like about six or seven years ago. They said it wouldn't work. Well, there's twice as much water that runs down the Murray-Darling, precipitates off this lake, so it's got to go somewhere. Put simply, you fill a lake below sea level in the middle of Australia and the providing winds take it up against the inside of the Great Dividing Range. And you take the northern rivers and a little tiny bit at the top, and when you put those little tiny bits together, it's bloody a lot of water. And you turn oh, yeah. that out onto the Great Inland Plain. And Queensland. the drought's sol- solved. It's not a bad idea, Marto. You've done it. Yeah. And we've got the refugees coming over here, the infrastructure. It's a wonderful idea, Bob. He's done it. Member for Kennedy, Bob Catter. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, Bob. Thanks for calling through. God bless all the listeners. All right, now, Jeremy, there's another North Queensland project, the Reed mm-hmm. Scheme. Just mm-hmm. describe that br- very briefly. Well, you've got the rivers that go out into the Gulf of Carpentaria, yeah. which you can build a big canal all the way along, tapping off some of the, the floodwaters of those rivers and divert them all the way through, which would end up flowing through to Lake Eyre once that, again. And that's a yeah. principle here. You're, you're yeah. maxim- there's an excess of water in yeah. some places. Yeah. You're just tapping into that excess. Yeah, you're not taking the entire flow. Yeah. You're just yeah. taking some of the floodwaters. Yeah. And, and it accumulates to several different rivers that you're crossing, and it end up flowing all the way through to Lake Eyre. And really, a lot of this water would end up evaporating again, falling back down as rain. So certainly it, c- it can do no harm and, and probably right. a lot of good. All right, now, the final project is the Clarence Scheme because this one would be mm. really beneficial to New South Wales right now. Mm. We'll put the map on the, the Bureau of Meteorology map on the, on the screen where you see the areas marked in drought. We've overlaid with it where these, these areas that would be improved by these projects. So how would the Clarence River Scheme mm-hmm. work? Similarly, uh, you're taking the water on one side of the Great Dividing Range and sending it over. Uh, now there's two different ways, and you can do both. You can now tunnel. This, river, this is north. This is in northern New South Wales. Though. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You can tunnel through to the Great Dividing Range Mountains, or you can uh, pump it over. Uh, the beauty about pumping it over is you can use that excess energy overnight, where you've got the, the power cheap. stations, yeah. uh, that particularly the, the coal-fired power stations that could have run 24 hours a day. You can use that you know, power in the middle of the night, pump it up there. And then when you do have peak demand, you can generate hydroelectricity as it flows down the other side. And that water would end up going all the way through to the Murray-Darling system in the Clarence River scheme. But that would be on the scale of the Snowy Mountain scheme. So it's a massive project. And it puts at least an extra 1,000 gigalitres into mm. what is ultimately the, the Murray-Darling um, mm. Basin, right? Mm. But for the, for the use of the farmers in New South Wales that are affected by drought yeah. right now. Um, the late great Professor mm. Lance Endersby did a lot mm. of work on that particular mm-hmm. project. Readers can, viewers can get copies of this in a special report we've put out 
that you can, you can call in and get a, a copy of called the Infrastructure Road to Recovery. We've got to take a break. Welcome back to the CEC report where we're discussing real solutions to drought and electricity prices. So Jeremy, on to electricity prices. Um, the question is, you, as you pose in an article in the Australian Alert Service this week, which people can call in and get a copy of as well, Jeremy has two articles on this subject. So if you want to know more, you can get a copy of the Infrastructure Road to Recovery and the, this week's Alert Service. How stupid are we when it comes to electricity prices? Mm. Mm. Tony Abbott has said um, he's... he's He's recently put all the blame on renewables. Mm. Um, is he right or mm -hmm. is, it, is there something else going on? Well, the privatisation plays a, a big, big role. And, uh, and that's what he never says. Of course. Uh, yeah. and, and the national competition policy, which forces the breakup or already has forced the breakup of the retail from the generation, from the distribution parts of the power so that all these government owned corporations are effectively run like private corporates and and uh, the the CEOs are on multi-millions is advertising marketing costs you're bombarded with ads telemarketers all this adds to your bill uh, yep. so that that is insane so sure you know the, the green energy is expensive and that's true but the privatization is a big part and so if you if we go back to before re renewable mm. energy and mm. before privatization mm. that's how far you got to go back to when we actually mm. genuinely had cheap electricity in Australia mm. well well back then you know we had the, the hydro schemes which is the best renewable that we do have is the hydroelectricity because you do have enormous energy flux density where you've got hundreds of metres of head of water forcing these turbines around, much more than a little bit of puff of wind with the wind yeah, turbines, yeah. and guaranteed all the time. Uh, whenever you turn it on, you'll get hydroelectricity. And we had power that was a fraction of the price uh, yeah. with the Tasmanian Hydro, the Snowy Mountain Scheme. And if we had nuclear power in Australia, which we're not even using, uh, there's enormous potential to have cheap power. Well, let's talk about the stupidity, mm. um, starting with coal. What are we doing with coal that's mm. so stupid? Mm. Well, we're, we're sending far more coal overseas than we're burning ourselves, selling it off billions and billions of dollars overseas for other countries to burn. Meanwhile, we're, we're shutting down our coal-fired power stations. So global emissions will keep growing anyway, anyway no matter what we do. It's insane. Uh, the same with uranium. We're selling off uranium overseas, but we have a ban on its use here. And uranium use overseas, mm. nuclear, as you, you mm. took, you've took, took, took mm. issue with a Labor member of parliament on this, mm. Mark Dreyfus, mm. nuclear power plants are mm. increasing around the world. Mm. Well, the, the capacity is, is dramatically expanding now with China's particular growth. Uh, yeah, there's, there's dozens and dozens of plants popping up but all even, over the place. But even in Japan, mm. where mm. the big scare was and they shut them down, mm. but you're mm. saying they're, they're bringing them back. Yeah, definitely. They've already opened several and they've got several that are planned to be constructed. So uh, they, they've just announced that the Japanese government's just announced in their energy plan that they do want to generate a very substantial amount of electricity from nuclear power. So that, that's coming back in Japan. And if the concern is climate change, if, mm. if you're that type of person, that is emissions-free energy. Mm. We provide the uranium, mm. but we don't let ourselves use it. Yeah, well, it doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, we, we need a complete change. We need to get out of the Paris Agreement, which is insane. We need to stop this tokenism of green policies, which are not even benefiting the environment anyway. I mean, if, if you look at the, the areas around our coal-fired power stations, the air is cleaner there, according to the, the EPA, the air is cleaner there than in Melbourne or Sydney, where all the vehicle emissions are more, more relevant. And as you said in your article, we need mm. to go to, back to a public ownership model where these things are not run for profit to gouge us all. Mm. Anyway, thanks, Jeremy, mm -hmm. for thanks. joining us and for that, thanks, those Robbie. insights. Call in and get a copy of these reports. As I said, thanks for watching the CEC report.